Folks, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, that was the chair, <laughs> in case that was caught by the microphone. Um, I'm going to begin, uh, if I can, with, with you, Dee, because uh, how long, how far into GDPR are we now? How, lo how old is the four dreaded letters? <laughs> it is almost a year and a half old. Almost a year. Stage. Now, th did, the, did the sky fall in? Did the world end? No, it did not. But it certainly changed the landscape since uh, May last year. For the better or for the worse? Obviously, you're going to say for the better. I am going to say for the better, but I'll back it up as well. So since the application of the GDPR last year, the idea of accountability of data controllers for the processing that they're undertaking has come front and center in all conversations about regulation about the pro and about the processing of personal data. And that shift in mindset and the shift in focus from a regulatory perspective has drawn some positive results and um, changes in behavior. I heard Ronan talking about this on the radio this morning, the idea that we've had the first fines coming through, British Airways being a prime example in another jurisdiction. They, they suffered a substantial fine, not to mention the reputational damage. D did it focus minds, focus corporate minds, that, that making sure data is secure and protected is more than just an inconvenience, it is a fundamental of what you're doing? I think it has, and I think that the fines are always the big ticket item. Enforcement is what we're always asked about. It's, they're the headlines. But actually, from a regulatory perspective, there's a much wider toolkit available to us as a data protection authority. So things like engagement um, with data controllers um, in the area of um, breaches in particular, We've spoken, um, it's been mentioned a few times today, about the time frame for notifying a breach. That engagement with the data protection authorities about breaches, that has come from the GDPR as well. That has been a focus. Emerald, one of the things, by the way, we are using Slido again here, so if you go to sli.do and put in the hashtag futuresec19, and we'll get to your questions from the floor at the very end. Uh, Emerald, privacy by design is, is, is a great idea. The idea that when you start something, you put privacy into the center and you build everything out around it. Um, and I, I remember ha sharing a panel very similar to this two years ago, just before GDPR came in, and it was very obvious that privacy was being bolted on in the hope that it would actually work. Um, ha has the landscape changed and, and people now are going, well, we put privacy first and then everything else after? Um, yes, the, the landscape has definitely changed. So privacy by design is absolutely crucial. So that's the concept of basically taking privacy into account from the entire product and service development lifecycle. However, I think that we need to start thinking this in, about this in a more broader sense. You know, privacy is absolutely crucial, but it's part now of this concept of digital ethics. And I think that, you know, you can develop products and services that are compliant with the GDPR but are still really unethical. Now, a great example of that is, you know, for example, the endless notifications and distractions. We are all incredibly distracted, and I'm sure we all have phantom vibrations off our phones where we think it has gone off. Now, I think it's really important to think of this, you know, more holistically because, you know, there was this study done at the University of Chicago in 2017, which I thought was horrifying and fascinating at the same time, which basically said, you know, your mobile phone, even when turned off, can reduce your cognitive capacity by taxing your attentional resources. Um, and, you know, technology should be designed to support human flourishing as opposed to undermining it. So, yeah, this, the landscape has changed. Privacy engineering has become incredibly popular. Um, there's a terrible shortage, like we need more people. But I also think we need to think about this more broadly. You mentioned digital ethics, which is an, it's an interesting concept. Um, and it's, it's one, I suppose, that in a world where ethics are constantly being challenged, it's, a, it's an obvious example of where, where people can run awry. And it, we could provide a fairly long list of things that have happened recently that could hardly be described as digitally ethical. Um, I, are we trying to shut the gate after the horse has bolted, elected a weird president, and caused Brexit? 
Sorry, I as in, that. Is, is digital ethics being brought in too late at a time? Because already we seem to have moved on quite quickly. Well, quickly. it depends on the company. I think let's, let's just name the most popular drama that we've seen recently, which is obviously Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. It's almost impossible to attend a conference like this and not talk about it. And I think while they did terrible things from a privacy perspective, you know, not having consent from the people whose data they were harvesting and not providing adequate transparency, a lot of what happened there was completely unethical. However, my experience with companies, and some of them are the bigger tech companies in Silicon Valley, the ones that are now being looked at, there is a real will by a lot of people to do the right thing. I don't think we need to say, you know, all the technology companies are inherently bad. Mm. I think the media would have us believe but, that. But, but bear in mind, again, we, 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 we talk about white hat hackers and the nasty hackers. Who wins the battle? Um, because if you're going to any corporate organization and saying, we can give you all of this data, look at all this wonderful data, look at the things you can do with it, the compulsion, the human compulsion is to use it in probably an unethical way if it gets you to your end result sooner. But the consequences have gotten too severe now. I think, like, I know I run the risk of so sounding way too dystopian here, but I think that if we look at the fact that we're questioning whether our elections are being, you know, lawfully campaigned for and decided. I think that there's a real responsibility now from the top down in companies to say, you know, we're going to do the right thing and to ensure that that gets incorporated into mm. the entire culture. Uh, David, uh, bringing it back to an organization like yours, the bank, um, you, you have huge challenges and no more than any other business that are out there. But when you're explaining to others in your management team, you understand it, you see the risks, you, you know what ethically you can and you can't do. Mm. How do you explain that to colleagues who might not necessarily have the same level of understanding that you do uh, but realize, and get them to the end point that you want to get them to? Well, I guess it's getting them to understand the trade-offs that are now required. So, for example, you look at obviously the privacy benefits now associated with the, the implementation of GDPR and you look at something like the info minimization requirements, but you have to trade that then against obviously within any bank, you're going to be looking to um, provide customers with you know, targeted information that's of value or of benefit to them. So that requires you know, obviously big data analytics and all that, that good stuff. But it's about recognizing those conflicts but also being able to address them. And I guess that's coming back to the, the privacy by design piece and uh, designed it from the start. Something that scared me recently was the idea that if you go on your holiday somewhere, that if you have a credit card that is used, that a certain bank will own a certain amount of machines, they can follow you around, work out what you're spending your money on and use that data. I mean, that sounds kind of scary. Mm -hmm. uh, is that allowed? Well, obviously, within uh, AIB, we put our customers first, so we wouldn't engage in <laughs> activities like that. But uh, again, it's been highly regulated entities. I, I can honestly say, and this is, goes for any, certainly any Irish financial institution now, is that they are cognizant of those requirements and those regulatory obligations. Like, we're reporting on you know, a weekly basis, not just to one regulator, but several regulators across the globe. And to your point, the consequences of non-compliance are, are severe. And I think what you're talking about there, not to say it hasn't happened in the past, but I think organizations are moving away from that. But I mean, at, at the same time, are we all a little laissez-faire? And I suppose I'll bring you in on this, Jason. Are we all laissez-faire with our approach? Because GDPR, fantastic as it is, the first time you were brought to any page, do you want to, yeah, whatever, move on? Um, the public is probably still the weakest link in this chain, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot of people, a lot of organizations change their, you know, their notices um, to, to introduce what they thought was a compliant notice. Um, but it just means that it's in our faces. Um, it's, you know, when you're trying to do something, it pops up, and it's still quite complicated. You, can, you know, you're not going to, to take the time to, to read it, so you press OK and you, without knowing exactly what you're you saying OK, okay to. Um, I mean, we are kind of you know, in a consumer society, so we want to get information fast, we want to move on. Um, so I think the, the idea is sound, you know, that we, we need to make sure people understand what they're, you know, what's going to happen with their data, but, but the way that we've implemented it um, may, maybe isn't, as, uh, isn't in line with what the, what the idea was. You've actually had the opportunity to look under the bonnet uh, and carry out a number of GDPR reviews. Yeah. Now, it's, it's always fun as an outside consultancy to go in and see, <laughs> they made a bags of it. Um, what did you find when you had a look? 
In, interpretation has been a, has been um, odd ac across the board. You know, so um, so in, in certain cases you've seen um, you know you maybe helped organisations to, uh, to to implement their controls and, and to implement um, I suppose the, the compliance framework, um, and then now you're going in. So you might know what good looks like. Um, and then you're doing an audit, and then you see, well, actually, that's that's quite an odd way of interpreting um, the you know the, the regulation. So, um, so things like the records and processing activities are, are aren't you know aren't always what what you would expect them to be. So mm. um, it's it's somebody has ticked a box and say, yeah, we have we have that we needed to have one, and we have it. Um, we've also found that that uh, when organisations are looking at risk. Um, so they've understood that you know when they're doing a, an impact assessment, they need to consider risk when they're looking at, at um, when they're investigating a breach. They, they're looking at risk, but they they haven't all looked at it from the uh, from the point of view of the data subject, looking at it from an organisation point of, point of view. So d does this does this item or this issue um, introduce a risk to our organisation? So so having that conversation afterwards, saying you haven't looked at it from the data subject point of view, is uh, interesting. So. And when you point out the error of their ways. How well is that received? Because they've been getting away great. They thought it was fantastic, the amount of information they were getting and using and thinking it was GDPR compliant. Uh, it's, uh, there, there is a surprise because, I mean, organizations work so hard to, to get there, or lots of organizations work so hard to get there. So, um, so saying, okay, you mean we haven't, you know, we need to do more. So, um, you know, there, there's, there's a comment has been made to me, says, how much is enough? Um, and you know, it's a, it's a fair point. You know, how much is enough? And it's it's, it's embedding this into into the, the you know into organisation processes, and, and you know, so it becomes part of of what the organisation organisation does, rather than just a you know a compliance tick box. Um, Deirdre, when, when uh, obviously you, you you here in Ireland uh, yourself and Helen Dixon, you uh, you work with the biggest data collection companies globally, um, and, and their EMEAs are all based here, and and you guys have responsibility for looking under the bonnet of them. Mm -hmm. And when we look at how well small companies, medium companies, large Irish companies regulate themselves at GDPR, we then look at the big players, the Facebooks, the Googles, who are hoovering up a huge amount of data for purposes that we all still don't fully understand. I have a regular argument with Jess Kelly, who's the tech correspondent on Newstalk. I'm fully convinced this is listening the whole time and suggesting weird stuff on Instagram uh, that I wouldn't necessarily want to buy, but I mentioned a word, and she tells me it's, ne it's not how it happens. But there is this weird thing. We no longer trust big tech, um, but that big tech is being used by everybody to invade our privacy. I mean, how do you counter that as the regulator? And, and how do you make sure that everybody is playing by the rules? So we spoke, I mentioned enforcement earlier. The DPC currently has 60, um, 61, excuse me, statutory inquiries open, and 21 <laughs> of those are into large tech companies that are main established here. Um, so we're not lead supervisory authority for all the tech firms, but for some of the main players we are. And that, those inquiries are important pieces of work to see what regulatory action needs to be taken by the DPC about the processing that's taking place by those, um, by those companies. But you're right, trust and confidence is key, and part of that goes to Jason's point, it's the public awareness of what is happening is also really important. So aside from regulatory enforcement action, which is very important, raising public awareness of what may be happening to their data in certain circumstances, the consequences of just pressing OK and getting on with it um, if you're visiting a website. It's ma making sure that people have, can make informed decisions is a key role of the regulator as well. Yeah, and, and again, understanding is key here. Um, it, it, what we have is we've got specialist companies, specialist individuals who can extract all sorts of information on your behalf that you mightn't have realized is necessarily there, but the fear is, and human, coming back to human nature, exploit it. Exploit it in a way that's to your advantage, regardless of the law and hope you don't get caught. Is there much of that going on? We will see when we have a look, um, <laughs> when we get the results of our um, bigger, um, bigger investigations. But I will say that from an engagement perspective and from a consultation perspective by some of the um, larger tech companies, 
we have seen um, a, a shift in behaviours and um, a shift towards interaction with data protection authorities, not just the DPC, but throughout Europe, um, that companies um, are showing willing to do the right thing. I, 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 is my phone listening to me? That's the question I really want to ask. Is it? I don't believe so. <laughs> That's as good as I'll take. Um, <laughs> Emerald, to you, uh, the challenge for you um, is that there's a lot of myths out there about this. As much as there is good information coming from regulators like the DPC, there's an awful lot of nonsense that has crept in and, and that people think they're doing the right thing, but it turns out they're doing the polar opposite because somebody wrote it down or misinterpreted it as the point was made earlier. How do you comply with that and what, what are you hearing? Yeah, I, I think that, like last year especially, the GDPR hype kind of reached its peak. I think it was beyond anybody's expectations, um, like how crazy it actually got. You know, it was like the GDPR is like the change of the millennium and all of that. Um, but I suppose everybody started writing about the GDPR. A lot of people who should have not been writing about it started writing about it. And this caused a lot of misinformation and it causes a lot of people who work in compliance, including myself, but also just people internally to have to do a lot of undoing. So I suppose a really popular myth is that you need consent for absolutely everything. Yeah. And that's just simply not true. Um, I suppose to put that into perspective and, and why this is sometimes not a thing, a great example would be in the employment context. So anytime that you have some sort of power imbalance, it might not be appropriate to rely on consent because if I go for a job and I get the job and I get the offer, what ends up happening is I just get handed a data protection notice from my employer and if I don't agree with it, I can't really argue in a valid way because if I say, well, I'd love to work for you, but I don't really like what you're gonna do with my data, so can we, can we have a conversation about that? I'll probably dilute my chances of, of actually getting hired. So that's a great example. Um, and, but there's loads of them. You know, there's people who say, I can't do my job because of consent or privacy and innovation can't coexist when they can happily coexist as long as you take the appropriate measures. David, the, the old fear in the bank would be the manager would leave his briefcase unattended on the train. Uh, and it would disappear, causing a panic. Um, and eventually the media would find out about six weeks later, there'd be a bit of noise around it, and the briefcase would have been found in a bin, and it'd be grand. Uh, now the rules are different, aren't they? Because in a hypothetical breach for any bank, the clock starts ticking the second you are informed, and you are under an obligation to come forward. Is that a good or a bad thing? Personally speaking, I think it's a good thing. So people talk about, from a, a regulatory uh, perspective, this 72-hour reporting requirement. And actually, uh, what I can tell you is that it's definitely driving efficiencies. So for example, you look at uh, security architectures across multiple organizations. You've, you've got stuff like intrusion detection devices, firewalls, you know, all this good stuff, right? But traditionally, you, know, you have someone who may be looking at alerts on a, whatever it is, a, a weekly basis, and there's no correlation going on between various different systems and activities. Whereas, as a result of this reporting requirement, those methodologies don't work anymore. We have to become more efficient. We have to get the information correlated. We have to introduce automation or machine learning into the equation and start getting you know, accurate views of all this information, but in a timely fashion. I mean, look, Deirdre seems very nice, but I mean, is there a sense that the DPC is like the Spanish Inquisition, that they're going to sweep in uh, after 72 hours, and, and, and God, God forbid you're not ready? Um, correct me if, if I'm wrong, Deirdre, but I don't think the DPC is expecting perfection, but what I think they are expecting <laughs> <laughs> is, 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 is an informed uh, position that's accurate. Do you, do you know what I'm getting at? It, it doesn't have to be absolutely everything, but it's here we're at. Here's, you know, the, the, the MI as to how we got here. Here's our plan to address. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's about getting a better view, getting, getting what you have and how you present it. I, it. Look, I mean, I'd imagine it is the case a lot, Jason. How often do they come to someone like yourselves at EY in an absolute panic? Because something has gone wrong, they haven't done what they were supposed to do, and uh, you guys are supposed, uh, uh, like, not quite the Spanish Inquisition, but the A-team uh, to come along in a black van and sort it all out for them. I mean, it's, it's unlikely that you would, uh, you'd be able to fix a problem if they haven't laid the groundwork. It, it tends to be, um, for, for, 
I suppose, hugely significant um, issues that, that they've come to, uh, to, to ourselves to help with maybe some forensics and see, you know, what, what happened, how did it happen? Um, when, you know, when I'm kind of looking at organizations, it, it, it's the more simpler things that, you know, the day-to-day the -day, um, that, you know, somebody has accidentally, you know, sent the wrong data or the right data to the wrong person or the wrong data to the right person. Um, and, and you know that's where the, the uh, I, I see most breaches. And um, so lots of organisations will have breach, you know, will have breaches regularly, but um, and they don't really want to report. So so the, yeah. the idea will, will be okay. How do we how do we get out of reporting this? I, and, and just before I move to the Q and A from the floor, in that scenario where we don't want to report, we don't want to expose that we have done the modern equivalent of leaving the briefcase on the train, Deirdre. But like, when, by the time you find out about it in the DPC, it's too late then to save your blushes, isn't it? Well, I suppose there are, there are a few different elements to um, breach notifications. So it is about having the information to back up the decisions that are made. So is there a risk to the rights and freedoms of individuals? And it is very important, as Jason said, to look at the risks to the data subjects. It's not about protecting um, the bottom line necessarily. The first and foremost has to be about the individual. So that's how the DPC will approach it. Okay. Look at the approach of the, of the organization. Let's throw the questions up on the screen from the Slido here, if we can. Um, uh, from Simon, does the panel think that the government is doing enough to create a climate of data protection and privacy in Ireland? Emerald, I'll put that to you. Oh, that depends, I suppose. Like, I'm probably better off not going into the whole public services card debacle. I suggest you look at dataprotection.ie <laughs> where there is a, a, of time. <laughs> a good part of the uh, report is available. Um, I do think that from the fact that the Data Protection Commissioner's Office has really upstaffed, and Deirdre can talk about that probably in a lot more detail than I can, um, they're very present. And I think that's really good because no matter what conference you attend, there is always a commitment from the regulator, which in a way is also, you know, governmental support, to be present and to be cooperative as opposed to being like the scary regu regulator you referred to earlier. So I think in a way, yes, but I think we can always do more. I think that there's a lot of personal data being handled in Ireland due to the presence of so many multinationals. Okay, um, how can we highlight the differences of data security and data privacy to organizations? There's a big disconnect uh, in some instances. Uh, Deirdre, do you wanna take that one? I think that the, <laughs> the most important um, thing for organizations to know is um, to know how they're processing personal data. Start, start from there and then look to see if whether they're um, organizational and technical measures that they have in place are indeed appropriate, uh, document that, and that's the first step for accountability, and that is where the differentiation between data security and privacy um, will come out. And one last question, how can we look to enforce companies to use data ethically when data has overtaken oil as the number one a commodity and history shows ethics always comes second? Jason, I'll leave you answer that. Oof. Um, I mean, it, it links back to what Deirdre has said, is, is what is the use of the data? So it's considering, um, I suppose, considering what are, you, what are you doing with it? Why are you doing it? And, and having, a, a, I suppose, a, a, an understanding of this is, this is not your data. You, you are a custodian of the data. It's been given to you for a particular reason. Um, and, and that reason should have been clear to, to the person who gives it to you. So, so I think it's, as long as we're, we're transparent to people, make sure that they are aware, of, of what, what the uses of that data. Make the print ever so slightly bigger. Uh, Make it a little and, and simpler a little to less understand. complex, you know, less legalistic, which is, which is mandatory, but you know, not everybody has done it. So, so you know, sim simplify things and, and then use it. You know, so if you want to do something with the data, okay, that, that may be reasonable, but, but ask people, tell people what you're doing with it. So you're sure it's not listening to me? <laughs> <laughs> My wife is convinced. Based on the evidence I have seen, <laughs> I am sure. <laughs> <laughs> the trickiest question of all. I'll ask Siri later on if she's listening. And ladies and gentlemen, our panel, Emerald Deleu, David Cal, Deirdre McGoldrick, and Jason Guy, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. <laughs>